Our first speaker today uh, is someone who has been an inspiration to me personally, um, fighting the good fight for uh, secularism in largely in the um, black community and among people of color. She's written several books, and I just want to share with you a little bit about uh, Sakibu Hutchinson. Sakibu is an educator and a writer. She received her doctorate from New York University and is the author of Imagining Transit, Race, Gender, and Transportation Politics in Los Angeles. Also, Moral Combat, Black Atheists, Gender Politics, and the Values Wars. Godless Americana, Race and Religious Rebels. And the novel, White Knights, Black Paradise. Her articles have been published in the Washington Post, the Huffington Post, Religion Dispatches, the Humanist Magazine, and the LA Times. She's a contributing editor for the Feminist Wire and the founder of the Women's Leadership Project, a feminist mentoring program for girls of color in South Los Angeles. Her forthcoming novel, Rock and Roll Heretic, The Life and Times of Rory Tharp, is due out in 2018. Let's welcome together Sakibu Hutchinson. Good morning. Thanks so much for hosting me, uh, to David and to all the other um, excellent free thought secular humanist groups that are gathered in coalition this morning. Good morning, heathens and those who love them. California, as many of you know, likes to pride itself on being this blue state liberal bastion, an antidote to the Trumpian southern midwestern cesspit that pushes back on gods, guns, and nuking big government. And yes, California lawmakers have been at the forefront of challenging Trumpian neo-fascism, most notably in declaring California a sanctuary state for undocumented immigrants, and fighting back against the continued assault on Obamacare and Medicaid, including this most recent draconian one. And yes, California does have its own modified version of the DREAM Act, that provides protection for undocumented young people. And California women are not yet poised on the brink of resorting to back alley abortions as they may be in states like te Texas, Mississippi, and Alabama that have dwindled down to only one abortion care provider in the state. And yet this climate masks a deep legacy of state violence, white supremacy, and segregation. Many of you may be aware that California used to have the Rolls Royce of public university systems. And now California shamefully leads the way on juvenile incarceration and probation. California, most notably LA, has become the poorest city in the nation and has one of the least affordable housing markets in the nation trotting behind New York City and San Francisco. Southern California has emerged as the homeless capital of the nation, the majority of those who are homeless being African American young people and adults. And so in the midst of this criminal travesty, it's always been interesting to me that when it comes to framing a social and racial justice agenda on socioeconomic disenfranchisement, particularly around public education and prisoner reentry, that the white dominated secular free thought humanist atheist you name it movement has been missing in action. It's interesting because the white Christian right is always galvanized when it comes to its issues. Wrongly so, but galvanized, mobilized. The white Christian right practically has its tentacles in every school board and city council and county commission zealously guarding and shepherding its issues, be it trying to shut down abortion access or trying to shut down sex education. And so this disconnect on the part of the white, secular, free thought, humanist, atheist, you name it, community, when it comes to social and racial justice, has everything to do, yes, with the nexus between white supremacy and white privilege. Because the majority of those bodies that are cycling in and out of adult prisons, juvenile prisons, and under-resourced, over-policed, zero-tolerance schools are the bodies of black, indigenous, and brown young people, a travesty. On our watch, schools have devolved into prisons, and prisons 
have morphed into de facto schools, broken and dysfunctional, warehousing children at younger and younger ages in what has become a criminal travesty of global proportions. And so it's not a revelation that the Trump and DeVos agenda is designed to radically destroy public schools under the guise of school choice and charters and vouchers that are supposed to be this Trojan horse alternative for desperate communities of color, quote unquote, and desperate parents of color. And there were many in the secular humanist atheist community that came out and decried the fact that the boss had been chosen to be education secretary, decried the fact that she was in fact a shill for multi-million dollar Christian fundamentalist foundations. But very few critique the fact that her trajectory and her agenda will radically ramp up the institutionalization of the school to prison pipeline, the sexual abuse to prison pipeline, and the disability to abuse pipeline that disproportionately suspends, expels, pushes out, and locks out scores and scores of children of color as a matter of course on our watch. Under DeVos and Trump, Billions of dollars will be slashed in Title I and Title II funding that goes to after school programming and college readiness and teacher training and health care for very poor students and civil rights protections for LGBTQI students. The very firmament of public education will disappear and decades of gains in educational justice will be reversed unless the radical and progressive left gets off of its ass and puts action behind the belief that public education should be a civil and a human right. What would it look like for a free thought agenda that prioritizes, that demands that public education is a civil and human right? What would it look like? As an educator, educator and a mentor, I'm profoundly lucky to work with young people of color and adults in school communities in South LA who are laying a foundation for progressive social change and feminist change, who are pushing back against the institutionalization of rape culture that polices and criminalizes and victim blames and shames girls of color, who are spearheading workshops and interventions with their peers on sexual harassment and sexual violence and anti-sexism and the school to prison pipeline most recently in a countywide Future of Feminism youth conference that focused on the connection between intersectionality and social justice. And so many of these young people, our first generation, will leave the hyper-segregated context of South LA for the hyper-segregated context of colleges and universities where they may never have an instructor or a dean who looks like them where the environment has gotten to be even more aggressively hostile and white supremacist towards youth of color, their lived experiences, and their political challenges. Many of these young people have grown up in the criminal shadow of the normalization of prison pipelining, of the normalization of draconian practices like mandatory random searches, which is policy and practice in the LAUSD, the second largest school district in the nation where you have young people who are rousted from their desks in classrooms while they are trying to receive instruction, having their backpacks ransacked for privileged shit, like white, white out and highlighters. And these have been deemed by the police state that exists in these districts as weapons. And this is occurring against the backdrop of the intensification of state violence against African-American cis, queer, and trans girls who are more likely to experience sexual abuse and sexual trauma and hence be funneled into prisons, into mass incarceration. So back in the day, we used to call push out, drop out, disengagement, implying that somehow students make an active choice when they are being pushed off the ledge of education. When students come to schools and don't see their cultures, their communities, their histories valued in the school curriculum, when they are being force-fed a white supremacist vision of history that suppresses free thought and suppresses critical thinking, push out 
in the alternative universe of our schools looks like black girls being targeted because they have quote unquote ethnic hair or because they are acting out. It looks like indigenous students being targeted for speaking their native languages. It looks like black trans and queer students being targeted when they defend themselves against bullying and brutalization and harassment. Many of you who have seen Moonlight may be familiar with what happens to the lead protagonist after he's brutalized by a fellow classmate. He is bounced off campus after he attempts to defend himself. There's an excellent book that came out a year ago by Dr. Monique Morris that looks at Push Out from the vantage point of African American girls. And it's called Push Out, and it's an excellent primer on educational justice activism. Nationwide, there have been many educational justice activists who are mobilizing around the hyper-militarization of our campuses, around the fact that we have millions of dollars, 64 million in LAUSD alone, going to police, going to surveillance equipment, going to paramilitary hardware for searches. And so the National Dignity in Schools campaign, which my organization, Black Skeptics LA and the Women's Leadership Project, are a part of, has called for a national moratorium on suspension and expulsion because of the horrendous data that's come out about disproportionality. The fact that African American boys are 10 times more likely to be suspended and expelled than our white boys. African American girls have similar stats, have the second highest rates of suspension and expulsion next to African American boys. Data has come out about the impact that suspension and expulsion disproportionalities have on queer and disabled students, for example. Nationwide, queer youth of color are more likely to be targeted by school staff and faculty for gender nonconformity. They are more likely to be suspended and expelled and pushed out of school because of these biased notions about how they should behave relative to their perceived gender and sexual orientation. According to the Center for American Progress, of the approximately 300,000 gay and trans youth who are arrested and are detained each year, more than 60% are black or Latinx. Many gay and trans youth leave their homes of their own accord to escape the conflict and emotional or physical abuse that can ensue. 26% report leaving their homes at some point, but more often they're pushed out and into the juvenile justice system by their own families. And so this last point underscores the deficit that exists in our community. And the fact that many of these young people who are being pushed out of their homes are being pushed out precisely because of religious persecution and discrimination and targeting and regimes of respectability. And so because there are so few supportive resources for queer black youth, a significant number wind up homeless and on the streets in LA County alone, 40% of homeless youth are queer, and the majority of those young people are, again, African American. And so, free thinking people of color simply do not have the luxury, the privilege, or the time to divorce free thinking and humanism from the very conditions of social, racial, gender, and sexuality-based inequality that inform access and equity in our communities that are under siege every second by gentrification, by declines in affordability, by foreclosure, and yes, by white influx. It is not sufficient for free thinkers of conscience to sit back and give themselves a cookie for going to the barricades for church-state separation. It's not enough to marinate in preciousness vis-a-vis -vis the evangelical unwashed, even though we are in this heightened state of neo-fascist theocracy. It's not enough to marinate in preciousness and privilege when we exist in a state where the dream of going on to higher education is rapidly vanishing. It's rapidly becoming the province of very privileged white young people where we live in a state where it is more likely for an African-American young person on an urban campus to come into regular contact with not just one police officer, but a bevy of police officers strutting around with entitlement on their campuses instead of a counselor. 
where we have a situation where only 20 to 22 percent of African American and Latinx young people graduate with passing courses in the classes, passing grades rather, in the classes that are required to get into UCs and Cal States. So I graduated from UCLA in the, <clears throat> the era of Duran Duran and Public Enemy. And the campus has gotten even wider and brighter and more tony since when I graduated, and certainly since the passage of Proposition 209 was dismantled public affirmative action. And recently I took my students on a campus tour to the Tony enclaves of UCLA. And it was a crash course in LA segregation for them. Some of you may be aware that Black Skeptics Los Angeles since 2013 has sponsored scholarship opportunities and educational leadership and advocacy opportunities for LGBTQI, undocumented, foster care, system involved, and secular young people. And we do so precisely to redress disparities in college access and make public education visible as a radical humanist issue against the tide of white photo op tokenism that thinks anti-racism is wearing a BLM t-shirt and taking up oxygen in POC spaces. One of our 2017 scholars is Lydia Mason. She is a black feminist activist and a disability rights activist from Louisville, Kentucky, and she's in her first year at NYU. And she said in her scholarship application essay, there came a day when I got tired of waiting for God to fix the world for me. I realized that I had the ability to set my own standards for the kind of person I wanted to be and that I had the responsibility for upholding those standards. As I entered high school, I embraced humanism wholeheartedly and began fighting for justice on my campus and in the community for all people on the basis of race, gender, sexual orientation, and disability status. I decided to stop waiting for someone or something to change the world and instead be that change myself. If I had not chosen to embrace humanism and take responsibility for my morality rather than leaving it up to religion, then I likely never would have become the activist I am today. Humanism demands that we stay woke and that we keep resisting, questioning, and slaying this Americana narrative of the throwaway, expendable young person that really has become the perverse hallmark of New Jim Pro California. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sakivu. If that didn't make some of you uncomfortable, you weren't paying attention. Uh, and you may want to listen to that recording again. That was like hot and fast. It was amazing. Thank you so much. Let's give her another round of applause.